Hello! Welcome to Memory, Memory Processes, and the Three-Stage Model of Memory. Let's begin by offering some motivation as well as a definition. Eric Kandel, the Nobel Prize winner who made tremendous progress on our understanding of memory at the neurobiological level, once said this about memory. Memory is the glue that binds our mental life together. Those of us who have a loved one who happens to be struggling with memory issues can certainly understand the difficulty that such individuals have in binding past events to their current situation. We might define memory in this way, differential responding to previously presented stimuli. Notice that this definition has an emphasis on the response, and that's important because it connects to an earlier conversation that we had about logical positivism, which is a branch of philosophy adopted by the behaviorists and many other psychologists that emphasizes the importance of evidence when we're attempting to understand some phenomena that we can't see directly, we have to infer. So one definition, and very much a logical positivist definition of memory, would be differential responding to previously presented stimuli. Having offered some motivation and a definition of memory, why don't we move on to understand three very important memory processes. Psychologists who study memory often focus on these three processes and they use it to help organize their investigation of memory. The first of these processes is said to be encoding, which is also referred to as acquisition. The second is storage, and the third is retrieval. In the slides to come, we'll say much more about each of these in turn, but for the moment, let's just note a few things. First, as we've mentioned, encoding is used synonymously with acquisition, and the encoding or acquisition phase relies very heavily on sensation and perception, which was a topic in an earlier video. Recall that environmental stimulation must be transduced into action potentials in the nervous system. We can recall also that we've talked previously about tabula rasa, and that sensation in particular helps us take environmental energy, which might be, for example, acoustic energy, or electromagnetic energy, or physical pressure that we might feel on our hands, or somewhere on our skin, or some form of chemical energy, and we transduce or transform that environmental energy into an action potential. That's the currency of the nervous system. This is what's going on during the encoding process. Any stimulus that is not encoded cannot be stored. So this is the first of the three processes of memory. Similarly, we can say that any item that is not stored cannot be retrieved. Importantly, whenever there is a failure in memory, that is to say, a failure to differentially respond to previously presented stimuli, that failure may have arisen from either the encoding or acquisition stage, or the storage stage, or the retrieval stage. And experimental psychologists are very good at designing experiments to help tease apart these separate contributions that encoding, storage, and retrieval each make to memory. Now that we've introduced these three different central memory processes, let's go on and elaborate a little bit further on each of these. We'll begin with encoding. Encoding, which we said is also acquisition, might be defined the following way. The process of converting sensory information into a form that we can report. Here's an alternate definition. We can think of it as the process of gaining new information. And this brings up the word information, and that of course brings us back to a mantra that we've had previously. Let's remind ourselves of our mantra that information is the reduction of uncertainty. Can you say that with me? Information is the reduction of uncertainty. To help us more fully understand how information in this context relates to encoding or acquisition, let's take a specific example. Let's say that you're at a cocktail party and you're being introduced to somebody and you hear their name, and it's an unfamiliar name to you. It's perhaps a first name you've never heard before. You might smile and politely ask them to spell that name. Here you're seeking more information. You're hoping to reduce the uncertainty about that person's name. There's an additional point to make about this encoding, and that is, while you're hearing the person's name, imagine just hypothetically that a loud sound goes off as that name is being enunciated. So for example, maybe there's a bang, somebody has dropped something in the environment. If you don't encode the name, you will not be able to store it later on. So encoding is going to set the stage for the next process, which will be storage. Encoding is absolutely essential for us to eventually have a memory of this person's name. Let's also go on and try to understand two different kinds of learning that are going to relate to encoding. So as we're trying to learn somebody's name, we might be making a deliberate effort to acquire knowledge for later use. We can call this intentional learning. It might also be that somehow you weren't intentionally trying to learn somebody's name, but you picked it up along the way. There was no deliberation, no explicit effort to do so, but you learned this incidentally. Incidental learning occurs all the time 
in young children. For example, they're learning the sounds of the language to which they are exposed. The child here is not deliberately trying to encode, for example, the letter D sound, but after a certain number of repetitions of the letter D sound, the child has in fact encoded that and later can differentially respond to it. Okay, so let's now assume that we have something encoded. Why don't we move on to the next stage, which is going to be the storage stage. We can define this as the creation of a permanent record of the encoded information. As we think about this creation of a permanent record of the encoded information, it's important to note that even if we had encoded something, it is possible that we just don't store it, and if we don't store it, we're not going to be able to retrieve it later on. This relates to the idea of consolidation. We have to somehow solidify the new information to transfer it from short to long-term memory. It's not enough to simply encode. We have to somehow make the transfer from one form of memory to another. In the last several decades, Researchers have begun to understand the important role of the hippocampus in the consolidation process, that is the storage process, and when the hippocampus becomes compromised, typically people will have trouble with this particular stage of memory, the storage stage. Hippocampus has a very interesting etymology, or where the word originates from. So the word hippocampus comes from the Greek hippos for horse and campus for sea monster. Here we have a diagram of a seahorse, and you can see the physical similarity that it bears to a picture of a hippocampus. And this has been known for many, many centuries. It can also be helpful to understand where the hippocampus is located within the brain. Here we have a picture of one lateral slice of the brain. You can see that the occipital lobe is back here. This would be the front portions of the person's brain. And here we have the hippocampus. So it's actually down a bit from the top and up a bit from the bottom. And if you could see it from left to right, as we'll see in the next picture, it's relatively central on both the vertical dimension and the horizontal dimension in this slice. If we move on to another brain slice, and here we have a coronal slice of the brain, we can see that the hippocampus is shaded in red. To be clear, there's another one on the contralateral side. So the hippocampus is actually a bilateral structure. That is, there's a hippocampus on the left and right side. Here also is one more view of the hippocampus. You can see that this person is looking at us, and shown here in red, we have the hippocampus, again, relatively far down this way, and somewhat medial, not very lateral, inside of the brain. So as we've said, the hippocampus, shown here, is very important in helping us to consolidate memories. The hippocampus also is known to play some other functions that have been recorded in single-cell recording experiments, and this diagram makes that very obvious. In this diagram, we have a mouse that's going to be moving around an elevated maze, and the different colored dots that you see here are corresponding to different action potentials that are being recorded from an electrode that is placed inside of this animal's hippocampus. As the animal is moving in this portion of the maze, a particular subset of hippocampal cells will become very active and they fire. As the animal begins to move along in the maze and comes to a different location, a different subset of hippocampal cells will begin to fire. And those are shown here in yellow. And again, as we move, we get through this aqua color. That's another set of hippocampal cells. It's almost as if the hippocampus has a spatial map and different portions of that become active as the animal is moving around to different portions of the maze. The action potentials in the preceding slide were recorded in what we call area CA1 of the hippocampus. These are said to be place cells. And there are different ways of referring to different areas of the hippocampus. For example, you might see in the literature that sometimes the report will indicate that the recordings were occurring in area CA1 or CA2 or CA3 and so forth. And this is, again, an indication that the recording was made inside of the hippocampus in a region called the cornu amanus, and we abbreviate that CA. So whenever you see CA1 or CA2, you know that the researchers have been making recordings in the hippocampus very often, though not always, in the so-called place cells, which basically contain something akin to the map of the animal's location. Okay, having noted that the hippocampus plays an important role in spatial location, but also in the consolidation of memory, let's move from storage and consolidation off to our third process, which is retrieval, the use of stored information. Psychologists often distinguish between two different varieties of retrieval. One is recall, and the other is recognition. Let's understand how those differ from each other. In the case of recall, we're talking about a type of retrieval that requires information about a previously presented stimulus that is not currently in the environment. Here, you're asked to pull information out of your memory, 
without having any kind of environmental prompt right in front of you. So for example, I might ask you to recall a memory from kindergarten. Notice that as you're looking at the screen and as you are listening to my voice, I'm not providing any information directly about your kindergarten experience. You'll have to do that without anything visually coming from this video or anything auditorily coming from this video. This would be an example of recall because there's nothing about the target memory item, your experience in kindergarten in this case, that's coming to you right now from this video. We can contrast this type of retrieval, which we call recall, with another type of retrieval, which is recognition. This is a type of retrieval that requires judging a stimulus that is physically present in the environment. Most people typically will report that recall is quite a bit more difficult than recognition. To understand an example of recognition, why don't we move ahead and take a look at a simple police lineup. In this picture, and each of the persons is donning a number, one through five, and here, you, as a witness to a particular crime, might be asked to recognize, in this recognition example, which of these folks may have committed the crime of interest. Notice that they're giving you five different examples to choose from. If they instead had asked you to report a description of these folks without showing you the picture, that would be an example of recall. When they're showing you the five different suspects here in the lineup, this is now an example of recognition. You have to recognize which one of these most closely matches your memory of the perpetrator of the crime. Another type of recognition test occurs in so-called standardized tests. You can think of the SAT or the ACT. There are different kinds of tests that are standardized, and they simply require you to select one of five options, kind of like in the lineup that we saw the last time around. Now, an interesting question that we can discuss is to what extent there are costs and benefits of colleges and universities going test optional, that is not requiring applicants to submit standardized test scores. Some people note that standardized test scores rely heavily on recognition, yet in everyday life, we have to do memory tests that go far beyond recognition. They require all different kinds of recall. And so some people believe that recognition tests are not appropriate ways to measure learning and scholastic achievement. Others counter that this is at least a good indicator, if not a perfect indicator, of how accomplished a student is in a particular topic. So it's an interesting debate. And a portion of that debate revolves around the distinction between recognition versus recall as two different ways of indexing memory, what a student has learned about a topic, for example. Okay, so having summarized these three major processes, those again are encoding or acquisition, storage and retrieval, why don't we go on to understand the so-called three-stage model of memory. This has a sensory memory component, followed by a short-term memory component, and then lastly, a long-term memory component. Importantly, as we look at sensory memory here and the link to short-term memory, we'll notice that this is somehow gated, if you will, by attention. There's an attentional gate here. That is, some things will make it into short-term memory and some things won't based on attention. If you can recall, we've previously defined attention as the selection of a sensory event. So in this stage, we have something that's very recently on our sensors, maybe on our eardrum or maybe on our retina, and we might choose to select some of those sensory events to the exclusion of others. That is to say that we've attended those, and only those that have been attended will make it past this gate, metaphorically speaking, into short-term memory. Within short-term memory, we might begin rehearsing and saying, for example, a phone number that we want to be able to dial in, we might say it to ourselves many, many times, either silently or aloud, as we're trying to hold on to it before we can eventually transfer it into a much more long-term memory store. At some other point, we might want to pull some information out of long-term memory and have it in our working memory or short-term memory. And we do use the phrases short-term memory and working memory interchangeably. Okay. Having introduced the three-stage model of memory, that would be sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory, why don't we say a little bit more about each? The first of these stages is the sensory memory, and we can define that as the portion of memory that holds sensory information for a few seconds or less after an item is perceived. Critically, note the very, very short time frame over which sensory memory is operating, just on the order of a few seconds. And some examples of sensory memory might help us. We often use the phrase iconic memory to refer to those fast decaying, those that is memories that are lasting only for a second or so, that are visual in nature. We also have echoic memory. You might see the word echo happening in here, and echo makes us think about sounds that are reverberating. This is the fast decaying store of auditory information. 
or we can think of haptic memory, the fast decaying store of tactile or touch information. These are different varieties of sensory memory, and again, they last only for a few seconds. And the duration of these different forms of memory will be partly what distinguishes one from the next. So let's move on and go to the next stage of memory, which would be short-term memory. We can define short-term memory, which we also call working memory, as a type of memory that operates in the seconds to minutes time scale, and it has a very limited capacity. Notice here that we have a time frame that's slightly longer than that which we had back in the domain of sensory memory. Now we get up to the order of minutes, but still there's a very limited capacity. Here, an important phenomena is so-called Miller's magic number, the alleged capacity of short-term memory that's sometimes abbreviated STM. You might see it also as WTM, and this is approximately seven items in memory, plus or minus two. So a typical healthy young person typically can recall from short-term or working memory something like between five and nine items. This is Miller's magic number, seven plus or minus two. After Miller had introduced this magic number of seven plus or minus two, a debate ensued as to what actually constitutes an item. And this leads to the important topic of chunking. Chunking is the process of organizing or recoding information to be remembered by grouping or combining items into larger units. So this is an important short-term memory phenomenon. And to give you an example of chunking, and to see how it relates back to Miller's magic number, we can consider the following. Let's say that we want to memorize a list of numbers. And let's say that list is 0, 11, 22, 33, 44, 55, 66, 77, 88, and 99. Now what's interesting there is if you were to write down each of those numbers, you would see that when you wrote down 0, you'd have a single digit there, but when you wrote down 11, you actually have two digits there. So a question arises as to how that information is organized. How is it chunked? Is 11 its own item? And is that one of the items? Or is 11 a 1 and a 1? And does that cost us two items now against our count from Miller's magic number? How about the 22? Is 22 its own number? Or is 22 a 2 and a 2? And does that cost us now two more units? So this is a debate that ensued early on. What exactly makes for an item that might be chunked or organized into memory? An interesting idea is this, and we'll actually make it a mantra. Organization is a key to memory. Can you say that with me? Organization is a key to memory. Good. Experts often have the same memory capacity as novices do, but what makes an expert an expert is their capacity to organize the information differently. When they organize it, they can turn it into a chunk, and that one chunk might constitute just one of the seven plus or minus two items that we have in our working memory. Novices like you and me might not be able to organize the information as effectively as experts can. So as a consequence, we have to take each of the components of information, and we have to use those components as items in our memory, and we have a less effective memory for those because we haven't organized them, we haven't rolled them up into one of the seven plus or minus two items that we get in Miller's magic number. Okay, so let's move away from chunking and talk about another short-term memory phenomena, and this is maintenance or so-called rote rehearsal. This is the act of repeating, either silently or aloud, information to be remembered. There are lots of examples of rote rehearsal. For example, let's say that you're listening to this video and you're trying to take some of notes on this video. It might be that as I'm speaking, you're trying to say something or repeat something to yourself so you can jot it down. This would be an example of maintenance or rote rehearsal. This happens all the time when students are taking notes in a classroom. They'll be busily writing and they'll almost be repeating what the professor has said time and time again until they can move their hand fast enough to capture it down on their note page. Maintenance or rote rehearsal is one way, perhaps not the most effective way, but it is one way of moving from short-term memory to long-term memory. We can define long-term memory, which is often abbreviated LTM, as a type of memory that operates on the timescales of minutes to years with a comparatively large capacity. Notice that we've moved from just a few seconds in the domain of sensory memory to seconds to minutes in the domain of short-term memory to now these really long time scales of minutes to sometimes years, sometimes decades. We have a much greater capacity also in long-term memory than we would in short-term memory. This is an analogy that sometimes helps students. Here we have STM or short-term memory, and you can think of that as a book that you hold on your lap right now. It's open, and it's open to a particular page. 
or the individual file currently open on your computer. As we're speaking right now, I happen to have this PowerPoint file open on my computer. We can contrast this with LTM, or long-term memory, and this would be more like the entire library, not just the particular book that you have on your lap. It might be your entire computer drive, not just the particular file that you happen to have open right now. So you can see that the entire drive or the entire library has a much greater capacity than the information that's held in a particular book that's on your lap right now or in a particular file that's open right now. So there are these huge differences, not only in time span, but also in the extent to which we have capacity. Long-term memory having a much greater capacity than short-term memory. Okay, so as an interim summary, we can remind ourselves that we have a three-stage model of memory, and these three stages consist of sensory memory, very, very short time scales, then short-term memory, also called working memory, and that's a slightly longer time scale, and also limited in capacity, and then off to long-term memory, which is very capacious and operates over many years or decades. Having summarized our three-stage model of memory, let's go on to understand another important memory phenomena, and this is called levels of processing. We can define levels of processing as an approach to the study of memory that emphasizes how memory depends on the qualities of the tasks one performs. To appreciate levels of processing, let's consider a distinction between shallow processing and deep processing. Shallow processing might be defined as tasks that require only sensory level information. So, for example, as I'm highlighting this particular line and you're thinking about this, you might notice that the text is written in a blue color. Okay, you can think about the word require here as being written in a blue color, and you would be able to do that, you would be able to process on its sensory quality even if you didn't know what the word require meant. I might also ask you to think about what rhymes with require. And you might say something like desire or acquire. Those are words that rhyme with require. And we're thinking now about the acoustic properties of the word require. Or we can think about the size of the font that you see on the screen in front of you. These, again, are very sensory processes. They have nothing to do with what the word require means. In fact, you could probably respond correctly to a whole bunch of sensory-related questions about the word require, even if you didn't know what the word require meant. We can contrast all of that with deprocessing. These are tasks that require semantic information, that is to say, knowledge of what an item means or how items relate to one another. So, going back to our example of require, we might ask you to define require. We might ask you to think of a near synonym or two. We might ask you to think also of an antonym, to think of the words opposite. When we're doing this, we're asking you to think about what the word means, and memory psychologists will call this a deeper level of processing than that which occurs for simple sensory or more shallow kinds of information that we might have about a target word. It will probably come as no surprise to you that when students are studying in a relatively shallow manner, their memories are somewhat fragile and are not particularly helpful when it comes time to take a test or to actually use that information to solve a problem. By contrast, if we engage in a deeper level of processing, where we've got semantic knowledge of what we're trying to learn, this is much more helpful for retaining that memory for a longer period of time and for using that information to solve a problem. Okay, let's proceed to some other memory-related phenomena. One that's been known for many, many years is the so-called primacy effect and also the recency effect. And these pertain to our performance on a recall test. Let's just remind ourselves here that we were contrasting earlier recall from recognition. So within the domain of recall, we have both primacy and recency effects. Let's define a primacy effect as the phenomenon in which items presented earliest in a sequence are recalled more frequently than those presented in the middle of the sequence. We can contrast this with the so-called recency effect. This can be defined as the phenomena in which items presented near the end of a sequence are recalled more frequently than those presented in the middle of a sequence. As we've mentioned, the primacy and recency effects have been known for a long, long time, and they go back, in fact, to Hermann Ebbinghaus, who, in the 19th century, did some early work in the study of memory, and he had discovered a primacy effect, which you see on the left side of this graph, and also a recency effect, shown on the right side of this graph. What he found was that when people are recalling lists of words, and he could even test himself on this, in fact, he's famous for having created gibberish words that he would present to himself in a random order and then attempt to recall. He noticed this U-shaped pattern. He was very good at recalling words that occurred early in the list, and quite good at recalling words late in the list, but there was a notable dip. 
this serial position effect where we had the intermediately presented words being recalled at much lower frequencies. Now here, an interesting question arises. Why are we having this lapse in recall that occurs toward the center of this positional sequence? Well, lots of different experiments have been run, and they've revealed some very interesting information about the serial position effect. The recency effect, that is, the ability to recall words that were occurring just toward the end of the list of words, the ones that we heard most recently, that can be disrupted with an interference task. And we can think of an interference task in this way. As an example, we can test recall after requiring participants to, say, count backwards from 100 by 7s. So let's say I've given you a list of words to recall, and I'm reading the list to you one after the next. And maybe there are 20 words in that list. After I finish the 20th word, rather than having you recall directly as many words as you can from that list of 20 words, I'll ask you instead to spend maybe 30 seconds, maybe a minute, to count backwards from 100 by 7s. And this presumably is disrupting your ability to use working memory to recall the words that occurred last in the list. So we get this disruption, which demonstrates that the recency effect relies on retrieval from working memory. The interference task does not similarly disrupt the primacy effect. That, again, was the relatively high level of performance that we had at the early portion of the list. Remember, recency is the later portion of the list being recalled very well. So the interference task that disrupts the recency does not similarly disrupt the primacy. And what's important about this is it suggests that there are distinct and very different neural events that govern the recency effect and the primacy effect. And this is nice to see and shows you the power of a well-conducted memory experiment. Now, a question arises, can we do just the opposite? Can we somehow disrupt the primacy effect without also disrupting the recency effect? And the answer is yes, in fact, you can. Experimental psychologists have done the following. They can enhance or reduce the primacy effect by slowing or speeding the stimulus presentation. So going back to our example, where I'm reading you 20 words from a list, I may have initially started by reading you those words at a rate of one every three seconds, just as an example. Well, I can slow that to one word every five seconds, or I can speed it up to one word every second, and by doing that, I change the magnitude of the primacy effect. Slowing the presentation rate allows more time for rote rehearsal and long-term storage, and this tends to increase the primacy effect. By contrast, speeding up the rate of presentation, that tends to reduce the primacy effect. So slowing or speeding the presentation rate has no effect on recency, again suggesting that distinct neural events govern the recency and primacy effects. Okay, so these distinct neural events bring us to an issue that we've addressed once before, and this will be the final issue in our video. We'll talk about the topic of dissociations. We can define an association, something that occurs when one behavior, say behavior A, can be disrupted without altering a separate behavior. We'll call that behavior B. And this suggests that at least some independence exists between the neural events that are governing these two behaviors, A and B. Sometimes we can even go further, and we can doubly dissociate two events. This occurs when one behavior, say behavior A, can be disrupted without altering the separate behavior, behavior B, and vice versa. And this now suggests considerable independence between the neural events that govern two behaviors. And what's really fun in the study of memory is that we can separately and doubly dissociate the serial position effect, showing that, in fact, distinct neural events are governing the recency effect and the primacy effect. Thanks for watching.